welcome to the International Scriabin 150 Festival. My name is James Palmer and I am the Secretary and Social Media Manager for the Scriabin Society of America. I'm excited today to share a lecture recital on Scriabin's 24 Preludes, Opus 11. The Opus 11 Preludes are Scriabin's only complete prelude cycle, traversing all the major and minor keys. These pieces provide an insightful look at the tonal harmonic language that characterized his early style and reveal his mastery of the miniature early on in his compositional output. These pieces were written between the years 1888 and 1896, with the majority written between 1895 and 1896. The reason for this flurry of activity stems from a challenge Scriabin's publisher Mitrofan Beliaev posed to him in 1895 to compose 48 preludes by the following year. In the end, Scriabin completed 47 pieces, which were distributed between Opus 11 and the smaller opuses 13, 15, 16, and 17. The Opus 11 preludes provide a valuable musical diary of Scriabin's travels on concert tours, with each bearing an inscription stating the year it was written and the city it was written in. The cycle follows the model of Chopin's Opus 28 set, pairing relative major and minor key preludes around the circle of fifths. Indeed, it is difficult to escape some mention of Chopin when talking about this cycle, as, on top of using similar harmonic language, Scriabin creates direct allusions to some of Chopin's work in several preludes in this set. Nevertheless, Scriabin's unique voice shines through in these youthful pieces, each quite distinct and musically self-sufficient. Scriabin himself declared in an 1896 letter to Beliaev that each prelude is a composition capable of standing on its own independently of the others. Scriabin left a handful of piano roll recordings dating from 1910, amongst which count recordings of numbers 1, 2, 13, and 14 from Opus 11. These recordings reveal a very free style of playing characterized by delicious rubato, free rhythm, and a certain nervous temperament, all of which are confirmed by contemporary accounts of his playing, including one from his first wife, Vera Ivanovna. The Opus 11 preludes have been recorded in full several times. Some of my personal favorite recordings are those of Gina Bauhauer, the ever-sensitive Igor Zhukov, and living pianist Maria Letberg. Luminary Scriabinist Vladimir Horowitz recorded several of the Opus 11 preludes in the 1950s. Let's now turn to the music. I will present the 24 preludes in batches of six, speaking briefly about the most salient features of each. Prelude number one in C major immediately demonstrates Scriabin's penchant for rhythmic ambiguity. Although the piece is uniformly composed of quintuplets, these quintuplets are displaced two quintuplet eighth notes ahead of the beat in a la breve time. This rhythmic basis lends the piece an improvisatory, undulating quality. Prelude number two in A minor is a languid waltz, built from decadent, chromatically falling apart harmony. The striking minor seventh that opens this piece undergirds a rueful, melodic gesture in the right hand that remains the most important motive throughout. Prelude number three is a sprightly, upbeat piece with triplet-duplet polyrhythms occurring frequently between the hands. Prelude number four is the earliest written piece to be included in this set, dating from 1888 when the composer was still a teenager. Its chromatically descending left hand line and plodding chordal accompaniment in the right hand give the piece a plaintive, cumbersome nature. Prelude number five is a dreamy reverie with a simple right hand melody backed by a melodic left hand accompaniment. The arpeggiated version of the opening melody that brings this piece to a close is one of the more exquisite moments in this entire prelude cycle. Prelude number six is something of an octaves etude characterized by patterns of interweaving octaves between the left and right hands. It is a violent and angry piece quite contrasting the pieces surrounding it.
Prelude number seven is a lovely barcarolle or boating piece. The texture of this prelude is quite typical of Scriabin, incorporating a melody, robust bass line, and expansive inner voice accompaniment that passes back and forth between the hands. The challenge to the pianist is to maintain the gracefulness of the music while navigating this tricky texture. Prelude number eight in F sharp minor is a nervous, agitated piece. While the left hand undertakes another expansive accompaniment, the right hand continually tries to melodically leap, each time inevitably tumbling back down the span of the leap in Sisyphean anguish. Prelude number nine is bittersweet, beginning with a C-sharp minor inflected left hand gesture. Both hands interact melodically throughout the piece, with the only real confirmation of E major happening at the ending cadence. Prelude number 10 in C-sharp minor is a spooky, miasmatic piece. It begins with a sotto voce chordal gesture, out of which pokes a contrasting re mi. After a briefly animated respite in the middle, this same material returns, full throttle, angry, before dissolving into an arpeggiated C-sharp minor chord by the end. Prelude number 11 in B major is an absolutely exquisite gem from this cycle. It may be the best example in the set of Scriabin's voice and pianism, employing a soaring, ravishing melody, another difficult accompaniment texture, frequent counter melodies, modal inflection, and chromatically induced tension. The piece closes with an extremely delicate coda, where the performer must maintain all of these elements while gradually softening into a sublime close. Prelude number 12 is a plaintive, gloomy piece that again shows how rhythmically ambiguous Scriabin's writing can be. Written in 9-8, it begins on an incomplete measure, employs cross rhythms at times, and has several fermatas in the middle of measures that all combine to create a sense of freely flowing music.
Prelude number 13 is a lovely aria, again composed of a strong chordal melody and gently melodic left-hand accompaniment. One will be hard-pressed not to acknowledge the similarity of this piece to its analogous number in Chopin's Opus 28 set. This was very likely a purposeful, perhaps tongue-in-cheek choice on Scriabin's part. Prelude number 14 is a contrastingly dramatic morsel that seems to draw upon the kind of wild rider music that Liszt and Schubert especially excelled at. The piece is written in the extraordinary time signature of 15-8, with offbeat sforzandos punctuating the texture at times. After a highly turbulent climax, the piece ends in a tumultuous chordal cascade and five turbocharged E-flat minor chords. Prelude number 15 is a strongly contrasting lullaby, with a simple yet melodious left-hand accompaniment in double thirds. The right hand sings a melody over this, and then the hand rolls switch. The piece ends in a simple restatement of the opening theme. Prelude number 16 is one of the more adventurous pieces in this cycle. It is written in mixed meter 5848, already an unusually modern choice that again lends the piece significant rhythmic ambiguity. Scriabin again seems to nod to Chopin here, quoting fragments in a B-flat minor prelude of the B-flat minor funeral march from the second piano sonata. The swirling gestures supporting these melodic fragments appear to allude to the swirling parallel voices of the fourth movement of Chopin's second sonata. In another notable move, Scriabin indicates that the una corda pedal on a modern piano be held nearly the entire piece, save for about two bars at the absolute climax of the prelude. Prelude number 17 is a deliciously short and sweet piece, based mostly on a sort of question-response pattern. Prelude number 18 is an agitated, difficult octaves etude. Scriabin tasks the performer to handle octaves in small leaps, scalar passages, very large leaps, and cross rhythms between the hands.
Prelude number 19 is an ecstatic, colorful piece, and another great example of Scriabin's difficult rhythmic writing. Again, as in Prelude 1, Scriabin takes an accompaniment figure in the left hand based on quintuplets, but displaces it one quintuplet sixteenth ahead of the downbeat. Atop of this, he puts an impassioned right hand melody that often uses triplets on the beat in cross rhythm with the left hand. Prelude number 20 is an anguished, turbulent piece that makes for another great octaves etude. Prelude number 21 is a stunning nocturne, metrically nearly totally ambiguous due to frequently changing meters and common moments of total silence. Prelude number 22 in G minor is another languid piece that recalls the chromatically decadent nature of prelude number 2 in A minor. A very salient French augmented sixth chord in measure 20 anticipates Scriabin's frequent use of this chord and the related whole tone scale later on in his stylistic development. Prelude number 23 is a cheery, flitting piece that draws upon the style of a mazurka. It is again difficult to escape acknowledging the similarities between this prelude and Chopin's F major prelude from Opus 28 due to their shared gestural features in the right hand and graceful left hand accompaniments. Prelude number 24 brings the cycle to a close in appropriately intrepid form. 
Written in mixed meter 6858, it makes heavy use of extreme dynamic contrasts and big left hand jumps in octaves. The prelude closes in a thunderous triple forte version of material heard early on in the piece, featuring huge left hand leaps and expansive arpeggiated right hand chords. Thank you. 
much for attending this lecture recital, and I do hope you'll continue taking part in the many wonderful and interesting events lined up for the next few days. Thank you.